Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Just remember when it was your first time, when you first got saved, you walked in and it's like, you know, what the heck's going on? There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hi there, I'm Bayless Conley, and we have something very special for you today. My wife and I are both going to be sharing, and we're talking about God's family, the church. If you've ever been disappointed in church, if you've ever been hurt, well, welcome to the club. The first time I arrived at whatever church it was, it suddenly became much more imperfect. But we're going to learn about what God wants for His house, for His family, for His church. Stay tuned. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. Well, are you ready for tonight? That was pretty rousing. Okay, I believe you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the church, your family. What an amazing idea. We just ask you for illumination tonight as we talk about your family. We pray that the eyes of our hearts would be flooded with light. Help us to see things as you see them, Heavenly Father. Help us to understand the direction you want us to go individually and as a, a church family. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place here tonight to communicate with us, to speak to our hearts, that Jesus might be glorified in and through our lives, individually and corporately. Yes, and it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I want to read some verses to you as we begin. The first one is Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. The verses will be up on the screens, but Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It's talking about the church, and it's referred to as a family. The whole family in heaven and earth. A lot of our brothers and sisters, well, they're already in heaven, and there's a whole lot on earth. Speaking of the church universal, every believer throughout the world is part of a great spiritual family. Acts 26, verses 17 and 18 says this, and it's the Apostle Paul as he relates his conversion experience on the Damascus Road and what Jesus said to him. And these are the words of the Lord to the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. See the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. Among other things, the invitation to accept Christ, to embrace salvation, is quite literally an invitation to become part of God's family. The scriptures refer to God as our Father. Jesus referred to him as our Heavenly Father. Believers are referred to in scripture as brothers and sisters. And listen, that's not just a metaphor. It's an actual spiritual family that we become a part of. It is true of the universal church, but it's most practically represented and lived out in the local church as we gather together, just as we're doing this Wednesday evening. And, you know, there's many similarities between a natural family and our spiritual family called the church. And there's a journey leading to maturity that God wants each and every member of his household, every member of his family, to take. He wants all of us to be on this journey toward maturity. And what Janet and I have done, we've broken it down into five categories. I'm going to list them, and then we're going to talk about them in turn. And listen, we readily acknowledge and we understand that though we've broken this down into five categories on this journey toward maturity that God wants his family to go toward, that 
They may not happen in this exact sequential order. And you could always add some things to it or, you know, say some things in a different way. But we felt this just really sort of gripped the heart of, of what God, excuse me, God wanted us to say. So first category is welcome and belonging. The second, learning and growing. The third, serving. The fourth, sharing. And the fifth, fun. And we're going to talk about, like I said, each of those in turn, starting with welcome and belonging. Janet. Hello. It's good to be here with you guys tonight. I put these glasses on and then I can see this really well, but you guys are more blurry. <laughs> so I just believe you're all smiling at me. <laughs> Actually, are, smiling honey, at they God. Are. <laughs> so welcome and belonging and love and acceptance. We're talking about God's family and in the church. And, you know, just like God intended for a natural family's home, our church home should really offer a beautiful atmosphere of unconditional love and acceptance. It's what every human heart cries out for. Does your heart cry out for love and acceptance, being understood? Absolutely. And when you come into church, you should sense a welcome, that you belong because you are welcome and you do belong in God's house and in his family. We sang that song tonight, I am who you say I am. And then in my father's house, there's a place for me. It's true. There's a place for you in his house, in his family. Uh, a few weeks back, Bayless had shared from the book of Mark where the father God had talked to his son Jesus. And he said to Jesus, he said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He just gave to Jesus the only words the Father tells us to his son in the Bible. He gave him love, acceptance, belonging, and he believed in him. And I believe tonight that to all of us in Christ, God is saying the same thing. You are my beloved children, and I am well pleased with you. Absolutely. Unconditional love and acceptance. Shortly after I was saved, um, my friend and I would go to church together, and um, this one, the church we were going to, we started talking to each other, and we just said, you know what? We just love this place. We cannot stay away because the teaching is so great, and they just love us for no reason. They just really love everybody, and we just couldn't stay away. I love that. God wants all of us to sense and partake of that love and acceptance in the church family. Did you know that? And I trust that you sense that when you come here. And also, he wants us to be part of cultivating and creating that atmosphere here in the church family. Um, in the late 80s, I, uh, a few women and I went to a conference up in the Northwest, and it was another church, and we were... We, of course, weren't from that church. We were outsiders. But we were so welcomed and so accommodated. And I remember just thinking, this is so beautiful. Every person, it just seems like all the staff and all the volunteers, they're just so happy with what they're doing. And they just are so happy to help, you know, in any way they can. And I thought to myself, this is awesome. And this is what I want to have at our church. And so that's what we have endeavored to do. Just just uh, so when people come that we are so happy to be here, so happy to welcome them, so happy to help them. And um, Paul said in Ephesians, he's, and um, he said this to us, for us tonight too. Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2 from the message. I just love this. It's so wonderful. He says, watch what God does. Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. Watch what God does, and then you do it, like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but his love was extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. And years ago, I read that, and I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, I'm loving my kids according to their behavior. 
And I said, oh, no, I can't do that anymore. I need to just love them no matter what. No strings attached. It helps them grow and flourish. When you are unconditionally loved, you can grow and flourish. Amen? Yes. And Paul said also in 1 Corinthians, he said, let love be your greatest aim. Talking about God's family in the church, that he wants that to be our priority, that we love one another. And in Galatians, it says, do good to everyone. Listen to this. But especially to those who are of the household of faith. And we're of the household of faith. And God wants us to really love each other. He wants that to be our priority, loving each other as a church family. It helps us all, including us, me, heal, grow, and flourish. And not only does it help all of us to flourish in life as we just love one another and really love one another and care about one another, but it also, uh, as it tells us in John 13, it says, our strong love for each other will prove to the world that we are his disciples. In other words, when people come into our church, our strong love for each other lets them know that God is in our midst and they'll know we're Christians by our love. They'll know God is here and they'll want what we have. God's family, welcome, belonging, unconditional love, and acceptance. Amen. You know, we recently had a going home celebration for one of the most influential members of Cottonwood Church that has ever been a part of the family since my wife and I began the church in August of 1983. Her name was Tammy Croms. Some of you may have had the, the pleasure and privilege of knowing Tammy. She left an indelible mark upon the lives of everyone that she came into contact with. And um, I cried quite a bit at the funeral service, at this, the celebration. Um, and in particular, when her son Josh got up and shared. And Josh shared when he was in, in youth group here one day, he was in 11th grade, and he's kind of running the ping pong table. He's beaten everybody. And his mom, Tammy, comes up to him and says, Josh, come here. And he says, I knew better than to make my mom ask twice. So I went over, even though I was running the table, what mom? She said, you see that kid over there? It's his first time here. Go hang out with him. He said he was so upset, but he did it. And he said the kid was not cool at all. After the service was over, Tammy went to Josh and said, thank you. He said, Mom, I already have friends here. And she said to him, you're not here to make friends. You're here to love the unloved. And Josh said that that statement changed his life. It changed the trajectory of his life. He said it was weird getting your life's calling from your mom when you were mad at her. But he said that's what happened. And, and he made the statement that everything he's done with his life and in his life since that time went on to become a school teacher has been based on that, to love those that feel unloved, to make people feel welcome, to let them know that they belong. You know, God said to Israel this in Deuteronomy 10 and 19. It says, therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In Exodus 23, God said, you know the heart of a stranger because you were a stranger. Just remember when it was your first time, when you first got saved, you walked in and it's like, you know, what the heck's going on? Everything was so new. You're like the new kid on the playground your family just moved into town. You don't know anybody. You feel awkward. God said, remember, you, you know the heart of a stranger. I think we should not have any strangers at Cottonwood Church. I feel like it's, it's every one of our job to, to sort of hone in and seek out that one that maybe is feeling unloved or feeling unwanted or not feeling apart and doing our best to reach out to them and making them feel welcome and making them feel accepted. And we need to do it until they start reaching out and loving the unloved 
as well. And friend, if we'll love people enough, they'll start to do it and we'll have a massive spiritual chain reaction where people just, I think they'll sense it when they step on the campus. There's just this spirit of, of welcome and, you know, welcome home to them. All right, our, our second point was learning and growing. A big part of that happens as the family gathers for worship and the teaching of the word. I believe we can never reach our full stature spiritually if we allow ourselves to become isolated from the family. That's one reason that Hebrews 10.25 commands us, not suggests to us, but commands us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And that phrase, the assembling of ourselves, is actually one Greek word. And it literally means a complete collection. It means a large gathering of all the believers. It doesn't refer to a, a few people getting together in a small group, which is good and it's important, it's necessary. But that command not to forsake the assembling of ourselves literally in the Greek language means a complete collection. In other words, come to church, come hang out when the whole family is there. And you know, in a natural family, the parents teach the children. They teach them how to speak. You know, say daddy. No, 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 say mama. Say, no, no, say daddy. We, we teach our children how to speak. We teach them right from wrong, from as early as they can understand. And we also try and teach them wisdom. No, the stove is hot. See the electric plug-in. You don't put a fork in there. Bad. That's dangerous. That will hurt you. And you know, as well, the older siblings in a, a, a natural family will teach the younger siblings as well as the, the parents. The same thing is true in our spiritual family. The pastors and the leaders, as well as the older brothers and sisters, help train and teach the younger ones so that they can grow and so that they can learn. We need to teach them the language of faith teach them how to speak. We need to teach them the language of praise. We need to teach them how to pray and make their requests known to the Father. We need to teach them right from wrong, that our Father does have a set of boundaries for the expression of our relationships. He has boundaries for our sexuality. He has boundaries for our speech. He has boundaries for our attitudes. You know, when I first got saved, I had a lot to learn when it came to God's boundaries for the expression of my sexuality. The world I came out of and the culture I came out of was so far out of bounds when, when put up next to, you know, God's requirements and, and God's boundaries and God's right and wrong when it came to, you know, sexuality. It was, it was just as different as light and dark. And I had to learn and trust that God as my creator was smarter than me. And I had to learn and trust that as my heavenly father, he actually had what was best for me as his motivation for setting up these boundaries. And when we come, we need to learn and we need to grow. Now, I learned that from sitting under good teaching and preaching. I learned it from brothers and sisters talking to me. Because like I said, you know, when it, when it came to that area of my life, things were so far out of whack, but it was pretty normal, you know, concerning the culture that I stepped out of. But it was not normal kingdom living. And uh, I also found out from my personal study of scriptures we do need to spend time in the Word. I tell you, have a love affair with your Bible. It's great. You know, there's a, a great blessing in putting the verses up on the screen, and I love the new technologies, but I think sometimes we can miss something because there was just something to follow along in, in your Bible and underlining things and writing it down, and you may do that with your, your electronic device. I do it all the time. I've got umpteen translations of the Bible on my phone and my iPads, and I'm, I'm marking things, and I've learned how to do all the notes, and I do it during services. But if you're not doing that, things can escape you pretty quickly. You know, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, 
It says to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. In Hebrews chapter 5, it speaks of the word of God as being solid food or meat. Jesus talked of the word of God as being bread. We cannot grow or be healthy spiritually if we don't eat. You know, a child that won't eat, that's cause for grave concern because that child will be unhealthy. That child will be weak. So the word is food for our spirit. It produces faith. It brings hope. Read it. Sin under good teaching and preaching. Learn and grow. And I think Janet might have something to say about that before we move on to the next point. I just wanted to say, along with the Word and being in big gatherings, we grow through relationship. We grow as Christians through relationship. Big gatherings, small gatherings, both are really necessary as Christians for us to grow. Acts 2.46, it says to the New Testament church, or was the New Testament church. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, the big gatherings, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. There were temple gatherings and there were smaller gatherings, and both were important. I think about Jesus, our ultimate example. He uh, spoke to big crowds, he was with the big crowds, but he also had relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he also had relationship with a smaller group, the disciples. Um, maybe an easier picture could be our own blood family, Bayless and me and our kids. We gather as a whole family, and it's rich and strong and full of life. But also, maybe just the girls go for a lunch. And uh, we get to relate on a little more personal level. And we um, solve all of our problems and all the problems of the world. <laughs> and maybe the guys go and they go golfing. And I understand. And we don't talk at all. They don't talk at all. It's awesome. They're in their golf box. There are no problems in the golf box. <laughs> um, but in those smaller gatherings, there's opportunity for conversation more specific to us personally. There's accountability and growth in understanding ourselves and other people. Um, there's the, the idea like, I can help you and you can help me in life and in faith. And in the larger gathering, we see the big picture and, you know, here we see there's greater strength in the whole. Um, but in the smaller gatherings, there's stuff more personal, and we can grow. But in both gatherings, there's refreshing, there's replenishing, and there is growth. Now, you might say, well, I am really happy with my own company. And that's great, because I am too. <laughs> but, and we do need time alone. But it can be easy, though, and I've been there, done this, to fool ourselves and think that we're more mature than we are when no one's challenging us. Um, the truth is, is that we're created in God's image as relational beings, and we miss out on so much richness in life if we isolate. In fact, in Proverbs, the eternal wisdom of God, he said, he who isolates himself is not wise. And yes, there are irritating, imperfect, and frustrating people. And also, some of us grew up in families with unhealthy relationships, and so we don't maybe have really great relational skills. So it makes it difficult, or you feel maybe hesitant to be in a smaller group setting. But small groups or small gatherings are a really great place to learn how to relate better and how to love one another better. And we have a lot of small group offerings here at the church. In, in small groups, I don't know if you've probably experienced this before, but there's like these moments like, you too? Oh, wow, you're not alone. Someone else has walked through some of the same things or having the same kind of uh, feelings as you. 
We're not the only one. We always grow faster and stronger by learning from each other rather than just on our own and being accountable to each other. Growth in God's family comes through His Word and through relationships. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. Bayless will continue with part two of his message next week. Well, we didn't get the message finished, at least in this broadcast, which means you're going to have to come back because you're not going to want to miss that final point. It is really, really important. And hey, I'm going to be back in uh, just a short time with something significant to share with you. So I'll see you in just a few moments. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Hello, friend. Bayless Conley here. I want to talk to you for just a moment about the benefit of supporting something that God is doing, and that something is our broadcast. You know, I travel around the world in connection with the broadcast that we do, and that there are so many stories. I wish I had time to sit down across your kitchen table uh, with you, have a cup of tea, and just tell you story after story. I remember one year I was in Vienna, Austria, and, and holding meetings, and uh, I preached the gospel with all my heart, gave an invitation that the front of that little church was flooded with people giving their life to Christ. I came back the next year, and I found out these stories. One of the ladies that came forward in that, that invitation to accept Jesus, she was one of the leading opera singers in the city. Well, she came forward, gave her life to Jesus, and she was one of the worship leaders when I came next year. They had a, a table set up for, for me to put some of my resources to make available for people. And there was this sweetest lady they had. She was working the, the book table and running that. Well, I, I came to find out that she was one of the people that came in that invitation as well. Turns out she had been a prostitute, and she had her two children with her. The trolley she was riding on broke down right in front of the church. She came in to see if her kids could use the bathroom ended up staying, listening to the message, and getting saved. A year later, she's in that church. She's volunteering a totally changed lifestyle. And listen, those are not unusual stories. I hear stories like that everywhere I go as a result from the broadcast going out. Listen, pray about being a partner with us and supporting on a monthly basis what we do. All of that becomes fruit that abounds to your account. Seriously, pray about it. And I pray that you would do something with us. Next week on Answers with Bayless Conley. I remember when I got saved, I was so grateful for what God had done in my life. And to me, and I'm, I'm sure it's different to, to everybody, but the Word of God was explosive to me. It was revolutionary to me. I couldn't get enough of it. We're grateful for the friends and partners of Answers with Bayless Conley who helped make this program possible. For more information and inspiration, visit BaylessConley.tv.